Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace to continue these teachings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We commence a new series titled Think Like Jesus. Think Like Jesus. The purpose of this series is to remind ourselves that the ultimate aim of Christianity is to produce people like Christ. The aim of Christianity is not to produce a millionaire. It is not to produce someone successful in a career. It is not to produce a smart manager or a statesman. The ultimate aim, the reason why God called you and chose you and elected you for eternal salvation is to make you look like Christ. Which means whoever has met you will have met Jesus Christ. If you cooperate with God through the Holy Spirit, the reward that is waiting for you is in heaven. There is nothing in this world that is sufficient to reward you for conforming to the image of Christ. The early disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 11 verse 26, Acts chapter 11 verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. People look at the disciples in those days, Peter, Barnabas, all the other believers, and they saw that these people, they look like Jesus. They spoke like Jesus. They behaved like Jesus. They lived like Jesus. And they called them Christians. Because they were like Christ. If you remove Christ from Christian, what you have left are three letters. I-A-N. And someone suggested I-A-N simply means I am nothing. Once you take Christ out of Christian, what you have left is I am nothing. The first responsibility of pastors, what God actually called the ministers of the gospel to do is to raise Christians to conform to the image of Christ. The fivefold offices that God enumerated in Ephesians chapter 4 have only one objective to build every Christian into the fullness of the stature. Of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, we read from verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers. Those are the fivefold offices in the church. Prophets, sorry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I go over that again. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth 
be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The reason why God ordained and called people to be apostles, to be prophets, to be evangelists, to be pastors, to be teachers, is that his people will attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Unfortunately, we see people being raised today to look like rulers of the Gentiles. You are not called to look like a worldly successful man. You are called to look like Christ. Church is focusing on raising millionaires. People who are relevant in the world. God wants people like Christ. People who will agree that if need be for the sake of the gospel, they will remain irrelevant in the world so they can be relevant in heaven. Each one of us have to decide. There are some of us who are only consumed with passion for what we see in the world. They are easily satisfied with all that the world has to offer. But there are people who are able to go through the scriptures and allow the Holy Spirit to impart to them the revelation of the greatness that is waiting for them in eternity. And they are prepared in this generation to pay the price so that they can reign with Christ. It all depends on you as an individual. But whatever choice that you make, you can no longer claim that you are deceived. You can only admit that you ignored the truth. And that is why we are starting this series, Think Like Jesus. Because if a man does not think like Jesus, there is no way he will speak like Jesus. There is no way he will live like Jesus. There is no way he will behave like Jesus. It all starts with the way that you think. If you are thinking like someone, you will behave like that person. We want to encourage us to begin to think like Jesus Christ. This is part one. In the series, Think Like Jesus. We shall go through the scriptures and try to find out how does Christ think? What does Christ think about? What are the things that are paramount to the mind of Christ? And let us challenge ourselves to also think in like manner. Like we mentioned, God wants people like Christ materially and financially. does not matter that they are irrelevant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 36 to 30. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised as God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 30, but of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God demands righteousness. God demands 
holiness. He demands sanctification. And God has discovered that the people who will comply to his standards, who are willing to listen to him, usually they are those who are despised in the world. The mighty men, the successful men, most of them don't have time for God. Why should they? Everything works out for them. Psalm 73 describes it as the prosperity of the wicked. Everything is falling in place. So, who is God? Why should they listen to him? Why should they? Well, they are children of the world. The children of the kingdom, they strive to be like Christ. You may be hearing me and you are a Christian and you go to church. Definitely, you go to church. If you are a Christian, you read the Bible, you might even be a church worker, you might even be a pastor. Please be reminded, the only reason why you are a Christian is to be Christ-like. The only reason why you are a Christian is to be like Christ. You are not a Christian to be, in quote, successful. Because success in the world, the way they use it now, has to do with lots of cash. God didn't save you so that you can go and accumulate wealth. God didn't save you so that you can go and build a career and be the most successful in your field. He chose you to conform to Christ. So whether it is in your career, whether it is in your ministry, whether it is in your business, you must show that you are like Christ. Anyone who has met you should say of certainty that is Christ. And that's why the Bible wants us that we should strive lawfully. Whatever we are doing for God, let us make sure that we strive lawfully. We walk according to the pattern that has been established for us in heaven. Every single individual has a unique pattern. That is a unique pattern of God for your life. That is a unique pattern of God for the person beside you. Every single person in the world, in billions, each one has a unique pattern. You should find your own pattern and comply with it. Don't try to copy. And don't try to be like another man. God did not create you a copy. You are original. And his purpose for your life, it is original. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. If a man strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully you must follow the pattern you must follow the law you must run the race according to the lane that has been mapped out for you don't cross to another person's lane you will get into trouble you must be like christ think like christ let it begin to ring in your mind now think like Christ. Think like Christ. What is the root of the problem? Why do we have Christians who find it difficult to emulate Christ? It has to do with what Schofield, uh, I'm sure you probably will have heard of Scofield's reference Bible. There was a Bible scholar who produced reference work to aid in Bible study. 
And that Bible is referred to as Caulfield's Reference Bible. Now, Brother Caulfield mentioned that there is something going on in the church now that is called Judaism of the New Testament Church. Judaism of the New Testament Church. You remember Judaism, the religion of the Israelites, the Old Testament religion of the Israelites. There is a mixture now of Judaism and Christianity. A mixture of the Old Testament and the New Testament. So you discover that in most instances, some pastors, they usually go to the Old Testament to pick principles from Old Testament, to pick Bible passages from Old Testament, to pick doctrines from the Old Testament, and apply it to New Testament saints. And they claim it is all the word of God. We will see it in a moment. Why this is dangerous. In Luke chapter 5. Verses 36 to 39. Luke chapter 5. Verses 36 to 39. Jesus says. And he. The Bible says. And he spoke also a parable to them. No man puts a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new makes a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agrees not with the old. Verse 37, And no man puts new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be Put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also, having drunk old wine, straight away desires new, for he says the old is better. That is where the problem is. Old Testament is old garment, New Testament is new garment. Old Testament is old wine. New Testament is new wine. You cannot mix both. You cannot. You cannot take a piece from the New Testament and use it to patch the Old Testament. It is not going to work. You cannot take the new wine of the Old Testament of the New Testament and pour it into the old wine skin of the Old Testament. It is not going to work. You put new wine into new wine skin. Now verse 39 is where the problem lies. Verse 39 in Luke chapter 5. No man also having drunk old wine straight away desires new for he says the old is better that is why when people encounter the doctrines of the old testament they prefer it they are very happy with it thou shall remember the lord thy god for he giveth the power to get wealth they shout amen some people will repeat the amen three times if somebody smites you on the right cheek, smite him back. I say, Amen. That is good. All my enemies, fire will roast you. All my enemies, you will die. Uh -huh. All this better. Once you give people the old wine, they say, Look, this old wine tastes better than the new wine. The new wine that says, Carry your cross and follow me. The new one that says if they slap you on the right cheek, turn the other to them. The new one that says, go and preach the gospel to all the world. Ah, I said, this old one is better. With this old one, you make a lot of money. You live in the choicest part of the city. You ride good cars. You live in mansion. 
You travel anywhere you want to. Than going to one village and say you are looking for souls there. This old wine is better. But that is not thinking like Christ. Because God has already finished the old covenant. That is why the book of Hebrews tells us that he has introduced a new one. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 to 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 to 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the day comes, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Verse 7, I will repeat it again. I will repeat. For if that first covenant, that's the Old Testament, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, the New Testament. As far as God is concerned, the Old Testament it cannot fulfill his purpose. So he has cancelled it. Verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13 says, In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. So as far as God is concerned, it doesn't exist. What you should come, you should concern yourself about as a Christian is how you are going to conform to the dictates of the new covenant, the new testament. And the only way that you can do that is to think like Jesus. It is to begin to study Jesus and pattern your life after Jesus. If you want to reign with him, that is, if you want to reign with him. Anyone who wants to reign with Jesus in eternity must live like Jesus now. It is not right to mix the Old Testament and the New Testament. It is not right. It is spiritually dangerous. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 throws more light into what we are saying. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. I read from verse 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in this last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, let's study it. God at sundry times in diverse manners, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Who are the fathers? The Old Testament saints. God spoke to the Old Testament saints by the prophets. God spoke to Old Testament saints through Isaiah, through Moses, through Jeremiah, through Samuel, through Malachi, through Haggai, through Zechariah. Those were the prophets which God used to speak to the Old Testament saints. Now, those prophets were not used to speak to you because you are New Testament saints. For the New Testament saints, verse 2 says, have in these last days spoken to us. Who are the us? The New Testament saints, Christians, by his son capital S, and the Son is Jesus. So God spoke to the Old Testament saints through the prophets. God is speaking to the New Testament saints through Jesus. Old Testament saints, the uh, Old Testament prophets did not speak to you. Therefore, if Moses says something and Jesus says something contrary, you forget that Moses ever spoke. <laughs> 
If Isaiah says something, if Jeremiah says something, if Jesus tells you something contrary, you forget that Isaiah and Jeremiah spoke. You only do what Jesus says because the person through whom God is talking to you is Jesus Christ. That means you must learn to think like Jesus. So somebody may now ask, so why was the Old Testament preserved? Why? If God is not talking to us through the Old Testament, then why did he give us the Bible that has both the Old Testament and the New Testament? If you say Old Testament saint, Old Testament is no longer relevant. No, I didn't say so. Don't misquote me. I didn't say so. It is God who says so. It is God who says so. That's why we looked at Luke chapter 5. That's why we looked at Hebrews chapter 8. And this time, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And see there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I will not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So, whatever you are experiencing now as a New Testament saint, the Old Testament saints also experienced it. They experienced baptism. They participated in Holy Communion. They ate the same spiritual meat and drank the same spiritual drink. They encountered Christ the way you are encountering Christ. As a type and shadow of what is to come. But the Bible says with many of them God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. It now says these things were our examples. That is why the Old Testament say Old Testament scripture was preserved as your examples for you to study the mistakes that the Old Testament saints made, for you to see how God dealt with the Old Testament saints and learn how not to take God for granted under the New Testament. Going on to verse. 7 of first corinthians chapter 10 the bible listed the five things that they did wrong they were idolaters they committed fornication they tempted christ see that the bible didn't say they tempted god they tempted christ they murmured they murmured now verse 11 says of course they committed idolatry i think i've mentioned that Okay, verse 11 now says, Now all these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. It happened to them for examples. The Old Testament was written for your admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. That is why the Old Testament was preserved. And God now warns, Wherefore let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That's why the Old Testament was preserved for us. That we should not make the mistake. We should not repeat the mistakes of the Old Testament saints. We will stop here because of time. This is part one of Think Like Jesus. We shall continue in part two. So this will be 1A. We shall continue in Think Like Jesus 1B. Because we are going to about five different teachings in this particular series. Think like Jesus. God bless.